Yeah, I really was that naive. I think I, I thought, well, we got a camera crew there, and they, it's always better to talk yeah. to the press than not to talk to run from them. The sun never looks good, so I figured they would eventually at least talk to me, and um, and I, you know, was surprised that by the end of the film that they didn't. And I was lucky at the end of the movie just to kind of sneak in at that Christmas party, yeah. which um, which actually it's in a cup with the eviction, the Christmas yeah. eviction. Those two events actually did happen the same day. We went to the eviction first early in the morning, like at yeah. eight in the morning, and it was just heart wrenching to watch them throw these kids' presents so wrapped out on the curb along the Christmas Christmas tree, all this stuff. And uh, it's Christmas Eve, and it's just like, I cannot believe this is going on. I mean, if I, I, just, I went up to the deputy and I said, I, you know, we've, between us here, we have $150 that she owes the landlord. You know, we'll just give it to you. Let her stay. He goes, he says, you better put that money away because you're offering money to an uh, officer here of the wow. county. And I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> wow. So we got done shooting, and we went and sat in the van, and just about everybody kind of broke down and cried after watching this happen. And um, so to kind of cheer everybody up, I said, well, let's go do something. Um, hey, I got an idea. Well, let's, try, let's, get, let's try to get Roger Smith one more time because we were near the end of shooting now. You know? yeah. and this is Christmas of 88. And um, and so, well, it's Christmas Eve. It's not going to be open down there. Oh, well, then we'll just do something else in Detroit. We'll get, go down and get some Coney Dogs or something. So, um, Chuck E. Cheese, right? So we, uh, so we get down there. We pull up to GM headquarters, and there's all this news media getting out uh, because uh, he's going to give his annual GM Christmas message. And I thought, oh my God! And so I said, here, just blend in with the rest of the news crews. So we just, you know, it really helps when you look like a roadie, you know, because you're just like carrying equipment, and you know, nobody thinks anything or something. So we got in there, and then they're handing out to the press. They're all on the platform with their cameras in the back, his speech. So I, I get a copy of it, and I'm going through the speech, and I'm going, oh my god, he's quoting Charles Dickens. I cannot believe this. Okay, so we only we only had, oh my god, maybe about, uh, I'm going to say we had three minutes of film left in the camera, and, you know, 16 millimeter rolls about a little over 10 minutes, and, um, and I had no other film, because I'm not making this movie, I'm broke. And there's no video. So, um, so I said to the cameraman, okay, look, I marked off the Dickens. Whatever you do, make sure you get this Dickens part on film. And then try to hold 30 seconds, if you can, left in the camera, because I'm going to try and get to him. Wow. And, um, and so he, he did that. And then at the end, I, you see these two guys in the frame, and they're security guys, and they grab my elbows, both of them. They've locked arms with me, so I can't get any, any closer to them. Um, and I really, actually, to tell you the truth, I actually thought about just lunging at him. Just, I mean, not with a weapon or anything, right. just me. This is all pre-9-11, of course. So yeah, you know, yeah. Do stuff like, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, just roll him on the ground a little bit. And, um, um, <laughs> it's, I just, but I, I, got, I got my question off to him if he would come to Flint with me, and he said that he wouldn't. So. Wow, amazing. Wow. Finally, finally I, I got some screen time with him, so. Incredible. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have a story in these days of video, I guess. Maybe a dying battery, but, but no. But and, and I but I'm seeing this is this was what was good about film. It forced you to think things out, and to also you were an editor in the field. Yeah. Because, because you had to think, what am I going to need here? I only have so much. Right. It's four hundred dollars for ten minutes to purchase the film from Kodak and then develop it into art and the sync and sync sound. So that's $400, but that's a lot of money, especially back then. So, um, but, but it, but it, it um, the discipline of it, I think, was really good, as was sitting at the steam deck and having to go through footage, and you're watching the footage as opposed to video, where you just, where you hit the click, click that scene, it goes up. And sometimes you'll never go back and look at the other stuff you shot, and sometimes there's just some gems in there. Um, but there's no way you would do it now with video because, first of all, you're shooting 60,000 hours of footage. So you, would, you wouldn't have the time to go back and look. Yeah. But, but we, were, we were just shooting, uh, we were shooting film, we didn't have that much of it. So we were able to, you know, um, take the time in the edit room and find those gems. But you didn't, it's like, did it occur to you, like, while you're making the film that it's, like, crazy if you be doing this, expending 
you sold your house? I mean, you didn't know that, that this was... You know, there's no way to be assured that Warner Brothers is going to pick up the film. Oh, God, no. No, yeah. I never expected that. Yeah. No, no, I was I... Like, well, I think, I don't know. I was probably always a little crazy. I mean, I, <laughs> but, I, but I also had also... Um, um, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Here Comes Trouble. And it's, a, it's, a, it's two dozen short stories uh, that are nonfiction They're from my life, from the, my childhood up through the making of this movie. And, um, and there were enough things that had happened in my brief life at that point that sort of led me to believe that I could sort of will things to happen, maybe. Yeah. Um, and also, I wasn't afraid of failure. Um, and I, I don't know where I learned that because, um, well, maybe from the nuns, actually. It was one of the good things from the nuns. It was kind of like, um, you learn by trial and error. That's how we learn starting as little children. I mean, that's how you learn to ride a bike, tie a shoe, get up and walk. It's yeah. all, you fall down. How many times you fall down before you can actually walk? And your parents are never angry at you, that you can't stand up and walk. They're, they are nurturing. So when we fail from ages zero to five, we're loved and nurtured. Um, but after that, we're given Fs. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, um, and so I never, I never thought, I thought, fail, I embraced failure because I learned something from it every time. And it was a great teacher uh, to me. And um, that's why I like to go to bad movies because I, I it will always be something there where I'll make a mental note, don't ever do that. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm so glad I saw somebody else do that, not me. Yeah. Um, so, um, right. Um, so I, I just, I've always had that attitude that I wasn't afraid of, of uh, and so I would do then crazy things like I ran for the Board of Education when I was 18 and, and uh, started a newspaper when I was 21 and, uh, and, and it was all set up to fail. I mean, none of it's going to, yeah. you know, supposed to survive. So, um, but, but, you know, I tell, especially younger filmmakers now, I don't, because I don't want to, I don't want to tell them not go to school because, you know, you probably should go to school, but, yeah. Because this first film of mine didn't happen until I was 35 years old. Right. That's a, that's 17 years I was an adult, making maybe you know eight to ten thousand a year at that time. So yeah. um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But uh, but for me it was it was fine. So was was it weird dealing then with success? I mean, so the success of the film because really all of a sudden after no, I, it wasn't because I was 35. I, I often okay. think this too with with kids or rappers or anybody who's has this huge success at 17 or 21 or whatever, that, but I already lived kind of a, a life. Yeah. So I, it, 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 it wasn't, um, I, had, I was properly grounded, and I had longtime friends that were still my friends, they're still my friends now, that, were, that made this movie with me. And so we're all, so I, it didn't, I, and, and plus I was still living in Michigan too. Most yeah. of the time. So I was isolated too from that, whatever that scene would be that I would get involved in. So I, I um, I mean, I was, I was surprised by things that I didn't think would happen. Um, I was surprised by this woman named Pauline Kale. You know, I just, like, I didn't really, I heard the name, you know, yeah. but I didn't really know, I didn't, don't think I ever read a movie review by her. And, uh, and so I had this huge run-in with her and uh, that I didn't even know that I was running into her. And then I was told later, oh, man, you just cooked your goose, you know. And so it's like, oh, wow, okay. So there were those things where just because I was just sort of naive and ignorant to the, yeah. to the business that I, I um, um, but maybe that worked in my favor too. Maybe because I wasn't, yeah. you know, um, somebody who read Pauline Kale. That, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. So uh, the, the next clip that we're going to see is kind of a detour because it's, um, it's a detour into feature film, fiction feature filmmaking and we're in uh, Canadian Bacon. This right. comedy with um, John Candy and, right. and so, Dan Aykroyd. So just how did that come about? Um, I didn't want to make another documentary. Yeah. I, I, I sort of made the anti-documentary that wasn't the National Film Board of Canada, and it wasn't uh, something that was, at least at that time, on PBS or pretty, you know, I, we used to call PBS pretty boring stuff. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, it's gotten better. And, and um, oh, I don't think they should have killed the youngest daughter and... Uh, the guy in the car crash uh, in the same season. That was just way too much. But, uh, right? I mean, was... <laughs> so, but uh, anyways, I, um, so I wanted, to write, I wanted to write a fiction film. And I, went, I was really upset at the first the Gulf War and how people just got behind this war. It's just like, this is like the nuttiest thing. And I just thought, it's like, 
Well, nobody's thinking this thing out. I mean, Bush's pop, Bush first Bush's popularity was like at seventy percent, and and I thought, really, nobody in this country even knows where Kuwait is. It, you know, it's it literally. Could the president of the United States just name any country on TV and say it's a threat, and the people would just go, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and then they get all patriotic and everything, and I'm like. Jesus, this is scary. And so, and this is about 1991. Um, so I write, uh, so I decided to write um, uh, a, a film where Canada would be the, the made up threat. The president's uh, poll numbers are down. Um, he, may, he may not be reelected. He needs to start a war, or at least not start a war, not start a war, but, but we have the American public believe that we have this external threat that we have to pull together behind him and, and what they're doing. Uh, to stop it. And so they start this whole Canadian people, and the American public buys it instantly that Canada could invade us at any moment. They support billions of dollars more in armaments and everything, and the president's popularity goes up. And the president is played by Alan Alda. Um, and um, and in, I think in the scene, uh, there is the, the sheriff of Niagara Falls, New York, <clears throat> and uh, his, his, uh, a couple of his deputies. Um, they actually take it a little bit too seriously because they're right on the border. They set up all this defense against the Canadians coming across the falls or whatever to yeah. invade uh, the U.S. And finally, they decide to take matters in their own hands, and they go. They decide to invade Canada themselves. So they go into into Niagara Falls, Canada, and uh, they steal a, a big a garbage truck or whatever, and uh, they're going to go to Toronto and. And, and blow up the, the secret weapon the Canadians supposedly have that, of course, the Canadians don't have because they just... I guess it wasn't too, too, uh, too many years after Grenada, after the, the war in Grenada. Uh, the, no, the movie, we yeah. wrote, the, wrote the movie before Grenada. Yeah, was before and, and before Wag the Dog, and before South Park, uh, <laughs> and they're Canadian. Thing. Okay, so uh, let's now show the second clip, and it's... Uh, yeah, it's actually a great scene. I just want to make a political yeah. film uh, that would play in shopping malls, not, <laughs> not in not in not the film form, but right. something that Americans would go see. So I asked John Candy to be in it, and he said yes. Uh, so I asked uh, Haskell Wexler to be my cinematographer, um, and I figured I would learn you know a lot from him doing this, and um, and uh, John and Alan Alda, um, a few of the others were very uh, helpful and supportive. But um, there were also a number of things that had so many, well, there were just some crazy things that happened while making this film, um, and sad things, the least of which being that John died at the end of it before we actually shot the end of the movie. He had to go shoot another movie in Mexico, and he died down there in that movie, so we didn't have the end of the film. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so um, I was actually going to make a documentary, a short film about this, my experience called Sophomore, your second film, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because it was, it was just one thing uh, after another, but uh, but I really, but I, overall, I mean, I had a great time uh, doing it. Um, it was so much easier than making a documentary, because you, <laughs> there's a script you're following, and they have to say what you told them to say. <laughs> and then when you're in the edit room, you just match the script to the footage, as opposed to the documentary, as anybody in here knows who makes documentaries, you really start making the film in the edit room. Right. That's really where you write it, so it's kind of an ass backwards way of making a movie. So I had, I had a good time, and John was a great guy, and I and, uh, was sorry to see him go. Yeah. But of course, when you write scripts, you're not going to think of things like um, the rabbits and Roger B. Pencer B. Like, there are things that you capture well, documentary that you can never make up. That's right. That's exactly right. No, that's no, right, right. I, I, think, I think that, that it, it, I've always thought that it'd be, it would be more difficult uh, to write something to match the level of the crazy things I find. Um, uh, but I couldn't have written those lines for Charles Weston in Bowling for Columbine. Yeah. The fact that he said what he said yeah. without any real prompting from me yeah. um, was like, I'm just sitting there going, I can't believe he just said yeah. this. We'll, we'll so, see some of that a little later. Um, so you really had a lot of different you know, options at the time. You were writing books, you were touring around college campuses to enormous audiences. Um, and, you, and then you, you know, it's not getting into television, you know, with a number of different series. So uh, I think the clip that we can see is the awful truth. But could you talk about just your interest in, in, in television and then how it was sort of 
there's, you know, once you're doing television, you have to produce a lot of material. I didn't want to do the television, but by that time I got an agent, and he's like bugging me, you know. <laughs> and he said, and, he, and I'm out in LA one day trying to get money for my next documentary. And um, he calls me up and says to uh, Warren Littlefield at NBC wants to have a meeting with you. Uh, can, can you do that? And I said, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't have anything to, I don't, there's nothing I want to do. There's nothing I want to pitch him. He goes, well, come up with something by 3 o'clock, because that's when he's free. And get right over there to go and meet him. And uh, so I'm like, oh, jeez. Uh, but I'm thinking, well, I got I, maybe I can raise some money, you know, if I, uh, maybe some money for the next documentary if I do this or whatever. So. So I, I, on the way over to Burbank, over, going over the hill, I, I come up with this idea of making a uh, kind of a, um, a humorous 60 minutes, like uh, do a do a show that's all it's all nonfiction stories, but with you know my sense of humor, but it's all real. It's all real. And um, so I go in there and I pitch them this thing called TV Nation, and um, and I tell them how you know we get these correspondence and we do these stories each week. Like I said, you know, on the first the first episode, the first thing I would do is. I would fire everybody on the show and move the show to Reynosa, Mexico, on the border, <laughs> and hire uh, Mexicans uh, at fifty cents an hour. So you you learned from Roger Smith the techniques. Of yes, yes, and then I would visit GE, who owned NBC, in Mexico. <laughs> so I'm thinking by then they're they're gonna like boot me out of here. Oh, it's hilarious! That's so funny. <laughs> uh. And I oh, okay, there's a let's see okay um uh, here's another idea I would um I would go over to Russia, which is now Russia, and just become Russia. Was the Soviet Union? They still had all these nuclear weapons aimed at us, and so I said I would find uh, uh, which missile was aimed at Flint, and I would go there and either try to buy the missile uh, with a big sack of cash, uh, or uh, decommission it, or have them, you know, uh, point it at Bob Eubanks' house or something. Like that. <laughs> so, <coughs> um. So they, they love that idea. They thought, okay, I've got to give them something where they could just like give me. Just say no already. Like, let me have my business. Yeah. So, then I, so, <laughs> so I know this one's going to do it. So I say, uh, well, you know, I was raised Catholic. And um, um, when I was young, you know, there were a lot of priests back then. So you had the old priest who was mean. And when you went to confession, he made you say five rosaries. Then you had the nice hippie priest who was young. And he would just say, have a nice day after you confess your sins. So you would try to get in the line. So that hope you know, this is one line. We hope to get the hippie guy, and because uh, the other guy. Too. So I said, so this idea would be basically I would take um, uh, uh, someone around Manhattan. This would be like a tourist guide for con for confessions, and um, this per and, I, and, and uh, this this person would essentially commit sins during the day, but they have to wouldn't be fake; it'd be real sins. We film her sinning. And um, and then she would go into the booth, the confession booth, with a hidden mic and camera, and confess the sins. And we would do this at like 20 Catholic churches in, in New York. And then we publish a guide as to when you're visiting New York and you're sinning, go to these churches. Because they don't give hardly any tenants. Stay away from these churches. And they were, oh my God, that's hilarious. I said, are you kidding me? You're going to have so much crap coming from the uh, Archbishop here and everybody... No, 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 we only get crap from Baptists, you know, this, uh, it's, this is great. And by the time I got back to the hotel on the other side of the mountain there, uh, there was a message on there from my agent saying that they wanted to do a pilot of wow. the show. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Um, so anyways, that became TV Nation. We actually did the, the sending thing with Janine Garofalo. Mm. And uh, we, did, we drove around Manhattan in a big Winnebago. And uh, we hired a Norwegian uh, male model uh, who she could lust after. Uh, in the Winnebago, it's all just lusty. Right, right. And but that's enough to sin. And then we would just drop her off at a church, and she would go confess her lust on her sin. And um, and we did the other ones too. We went to Mexico, we went to the Soviet Union, and we did a whole bunch of things. And and um, and, um, and then we ended up winning the, the very first primetime uh, Emmy Award for a uh, nonfiction uh, show, which then became unfortunately reality shows. And, right. And there you go. But you did put out a tuxedo for that, right? With a baseball cap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah I mean, that's right. We won. We won. We, yeah, we went up there. You know what's so cool about that? The Emmy Awards, uh, the, the people they had decided to be the presenters of the first documentary nonfiction series award uh, uh, it was Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, 
uh, and Steve Allen. Wow. Where the, they came out, they were the three, and they did a little shtick at the microphone, and then they read the nominees, and then they announced their name. So, yeah, it was pretty good. So we have a clip. The clip is actually from, from The Awful Truth. Oh, yeah, so then we did TV Nation again, but for another network, but we called it The Awful Truth. Right. It's the same show. Yeah. Uh, nobody had, had heard of Red Cross before, other than at yeah. the Matthew Shepard's funeral just happened. That's where we first saw that on the news, and we just thought that this guy's got to be crazy. And the best way to deal with him was through ridicule and uh, satire. And, uh, and um, and so we went down there. But we, I took that. We, we went all. We went. There were 23 states at that time where sodomy was illegal, and so we wanted to try and hit as many states as we could with these, you know, 20 guys having sex in the um, in the uh, in the Winnebago. So um, and because it was documentary, they actually had to have sex in each of these uh, states. Um, I was the designated heterosexual, uh, so I drove the uh, the sodomobile. But, uh, certainly. Um, was able to take a lot of this, and, and actually they hired some of my people, my crew, uh, the, the, the to um, um, uh, to do it in a way where they could get it passed, but without being, without um, you, you know, I don't know how to say this. Um, I mean, John and I are different uh, people. Yeah. Uh, they have a different agenda. I mean, he's a, he's an excellent comedian. I think his, yeah. his first mission always is, is to find it whatever is funny uh, and make you laugh. And, um, um, but I know, I don't know, I mean, Stephen Colbert, does, I mean, that's one of the best shows on TV, uh, the Colbert Report, so. Yeah. Um, but what would be hard for me these days is, um, um, there's no way I could walk into GM corporate headquarters with a camera crew. We need right. near the place now. Yeah. Post 9-11, all headquarters and all government buildings and everything. It's very, very hard. I mean, I, I filmed the thing on, on TV Nation here, on the awful truth here with, um, I hired an actual pimp, a real, a real pimp in Washington D.C., um, to um, uh, and gave him actual American cash, and he walked from uh, congressional office to congressional office of different congressmen and senators um, to try, you know, because he wanted them to be his uh, prostitutes, mm -hmm. and, for, and and he would be, and he would get them the money, <laughs> and. Um, I can imagine walking through Congress right now with an actual pimp, yeah. you know, dressed as a pimp, yeah. walking with me down the hallway. It would never happen. So I, I just, I don't, um, I, I don't, uh, I don't. It would be hard to do the show now. Yeah, yeah. But um, um, yeah. And how hard is it to set up the feature films that you wanted to do? I mean, you certainly had a success of Roger and me and, and a lot of. Fame, but like uh, we're gonna, you know, next look at Foley and Columbine. But was it uh, sort of, you know, what was it like to get that that off the ground? When did you decide that was gonna be your next feature film? You know, what made you? We were making the awful truth and came in that morning and it came on the TV, the Columbine shooting, and it was just, um, you know, just sat there thinking this is just absolutely horrible and what can we do and. Um, um, and one of the things we would do on both TV shows is uh, with the writers and myself is at the, at the beginning of the season, um, we put on the blackboard, um, let's make a list of the things you can't make fun of, mm -hmm. where there's absolutely no humor in it. Mm -hmm. So certainly school shooting would be one of those things. Um, and, uh, and so we would then try to, through the season, do a piece on each of these things that you can't use humor or satire. Holocaust, HIV, um, you know, those things are just taboo. Yeah. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can pull it off. Let's see how close to the line we can go with this. And so, yeah. so I, I thought maybe there's a way to do this with uh, with you know the sort of you know dark humor, um, um, but 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 say some things. And I think Bully for Columbine was uh, the the purpose of the film changed while we were making it because mm -hmm. I started out just thinking, well, we just need stronger gun laws. Right. But um, I came to realize that it wasn't the laws that were the problem, it was us, the yeah. Americans. Yeah, yeah that, because they don't do this in other countries. Yeah. And I went to Canada and I showed out that seven out of ten Canadian, seven out of every ten Canadian homes has a gun in it. Usually a hunting rifle, but a gun. You yeah. can kill somebody with it. Yeah. Um, or a shotgun. Right. Um, uh, I think the last school shooting was with a, a shotgun. Uh, it was uh, in um, near Columbine. Right. Uh, there a couple months ago. 
and yet the Canadians don't kill each other. Right. And why is that? Their kids watch the same violent video games, they have the same social problems that we have. Uh, well, except, are you going to show the Heston thing here? Is that yeah, oh, yeah. Except, yes, except as Heston, Mr. Heston points out to me, there's one thing they have that's a little different. And maybe that's the problem. Uh, so before we see that clip, I guess just how did you, you know, because that's certainly one of the most talked about sections in the film. We're not going to see the entire thing, it's about a six minute uh, piece, we'll see like the end part of it, but how did you, was it difficult to get him to be in it? Was there a suspicion, uh, you know, from him? Well, I didn't, I didn't want him in the film. Um, that was my original intention, was not it. My, I don't want. I don't make my films where where, where mm -hmm. I put things in there that you would expect to be in there. So if, if it's a if it's a gun film, certainly the NRA right. is going to be in the film. And um, and I don't want to make the film that the audience is expecting to see. I want to make the film that I want to make, and let the audience be somewhat surprised you know, by where I'm going with it. I mean that's what we like. That's one of the hallmarks of a movie that we like to watch is one that we don't know what's going to happen ten minutes from now. Yeah. But if you come to my, if you come to a film like Going to Combine, I mean, why would you come to it? If you, if you thought it was just about we need to have stronger gun control laws, it's Friday night. I worked hard all yeah. night. I do not need to go watch a movie about stronger gun laws. Yeah. In fact, I already agree with it. So why? Right. What am I going to get from this movie that's going to tell me anything I don't already know about how stupid it is the way that our gun laws are structured in this country? Yeah. So, so that's why I, I, I think maybe that's um, why I've had some of the success I've had is that people will come to the my films because they know that they don't know what they're going to see and they don't know where what closet I'm going to come out of and it's you know and that's good that's yeah. always good that that's a good book yeah. if you know ten pages before you get there what's going to happen you put the book down you actually yeah. get bored with it yeah. and 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 because I I believe the documentaries are somewhat boring and because I because I also believe that people go to the movies for entertainment yeah. they don't go for a political speech you go to a political rally for a political speech you join a political party. Or if you want a sermon, you go to church or someplace else. You know, you don't. That, that, you don't go to the movie theater for a sermon. Yeah. I'm gonna, you know, that, that, I don't understand why documentary filmmakers make these films. They must know this. I must impart this knowledge. And if uh, yes, yes, you're right. The public should know this. Yeah. The public should know about Monsanto. But you, if you, it, but they won't know about it because you're going to make a film where they're going to go. I already know what they're going to say. Or yeah. I worked hard all week. It's Friday night. And, you know, I, I told you this earlier, that yeah. I, I have, a, I have a, a little sign I hang in the, uh, I put my edit room through the editors uh, to remind them. It says, uh, don't forget that people want to go home and have sex after this movie. And uh, because, you know, the Americans, we go to the movies, it's a date night or it's whatever, and you want to, you want to, I mean, I'm not saying you got to leave there all happy and everything, right. but at least in my films, I want you to walk out with an active emotion. I don't want you to be depressed. I want you to walk out, and as you pass the goobers and the raisinettes, Ask them if they have any uh, uh, pitchforks or torches. You know, in other words, I want you angry yeah. and moving and something. I want your juices flowing. And I think, I think, that's not just my theory, that the humor in these movies helps alleviate some of the very sad things in the film. And by alleviating it during the film, with these, there's these moments of humor, like a, like the thing on top of a pressure cooker, yeah. it lets off, it lets you let off some of that depression. And, and then depression is a negative, a passive emotion. Uh, anger is active. And, and if you can leave angry, good anger, you yeah. know, um, then, 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 but I, think, I don't think they would be angry if it wasn't funny. I know that sounds so counterintuitive, but it, uh, I think that's what makes yeah. some of this work.